tonight's webinar is called Watch Your Language. And the presenter tonight is Mike Bush. He is a Savvy Aircraft Maintenance, he's with Savvy Aircraft Maintenance Management, Inc. He's a CFI. He's an author of numerous aviation publications, four numerous aviation publications, excuse me. He's an AMP, and he's been an Aviation Maintenance Tech of the Year in 2008. Nice. And he's, of course, an EA member. So, why don't we go ahead and get started here? I'm going to pass this on over to Mike. Good evening, everybody. Uh, the subject uh, tonight, uh, this, the, the, the topic, it's called What's Your Language? And it has to do with the use of uh, various um, uh, specific terms uh, when talking to uh, shops and mechanics to make sure that they do what you really intended. Um, and l let me start off this discussion by telling you the story of a of an aircraft owner uh, by the name of uh, Jim, who who uh, contacted me <clears throat> uh, a little while back. Um, Jim owns a Cessna 182 with a Continental 0470R engine in it. And um, in the course of an annual inspection, uh, his mechanic uh, needed to pull a cylinder. And when he pulled the cylinder, he looked in the hole and discovered that um, uh, that, that Jim's uh, Skyline engine had a badly spalled cam lobe. So um, he, he gave Jim the bad news and said that the engine was going to have to come out of the airplane and be taken apart <clears throat> in order to, uh, to transplant the cam. Uh, Jim's mechanic uh, offered to do this work himself. Uh, and uh, estimated that the cost of tearing down the engine and replacing the bad cam uh, would come to uh, roughly $10,000. Uh, Jim went ahead and approved the work, and the mechanic uh, started pulling the engine. And um, in a subsequent discussion, uh, Jim said to the mechanic, um, uh, since we're tearing the engine down now, would it make sense to go ahead and do a major overhaul? Um, the engine wasn't at TBO. In fact, it was only about halfway to TBO at the time. Um, but it just seemed to Jim logical that if we're, we're going to all the trouble of pulling the engine out of the airplane and tearing it down, um, it might make sense to just uh, go ahead and, and, and do a major at that point. Uh, the mechanic replied to him that he would be glad to uh, – uh, to do a major overhaul on the engine, but that it would be much, much more expensive than simply uh, uh, tearing down the engine and replacing the cam and, and, and the other parts that you always replace when an engine is torn down. In fact, the mechanic estimated that uh, converting this proposed repair into a major overhaul uh, would increase the co cost by about a factor of three. Uh, Jim was... Uh, was quite surprised at that and um, asked the mechanic why the overhaul was was so much more expensive uh, than the repair. Uh, the mechanic then uh, pulled out a copy of um, a Continental Service Bullet, an SB 97-6B, entitled Mandatory Replacement Parts, and showed him uh, all of the stuff that has to be replaced uh, any time an engine is overhauled. Um, and uh, SB 976B, uh, that's the Continental Service Bullet, and there's a, a, a corresponding Lycoming Service Bullet that gives the same information. But the Continental Service Bullet <clears throat> says that at each engine overhaul, um, the magnetos, uh, fuel system, alternator, starter, starter adapter have to be overhauled. So basically, all of the rotating accessories that are bolted to the engine are required to be overhauled when the engine is overhauled. Um, and in addition, a long laundry list of parts must be discarded and replaced with new uh, every time the engine is overhauled. And some of these parts are very expensive. Just to give you an idea of, of, uh, of uh, the gist of 
what's listed in this service bulletin as things that have to be replaced with new parts at um, at every uh, overhaul of a Continental engine. Um, we're talking about all bearings, all bushings, uh, counterweight pins, retainers, and snap rings. Those are the, the uh, harmonic dampeners, uh, the counterweights on the, on the crankshaft. All connecting rod bolts, connecting rod nuts, mag and alternator drive bushings, all exhaust valves and exhaust valve rotocoils, all intake and exhaust valve springs and, uh, and keepers. Um, these two are, are pretty bad, but on these, uh, on the 0470R and other sand cast continental engines, uh, the crankshaft gear and the camshaft gear um, uh, have to be up updated to the very latest version. And those two gears alone are about $5,000. Um, and they would have had to have been replaced in Jim's engine uh, in order for the engine to be overhauled. Um, the camshaft has to be replaced. Uh, oh, excuse me, the, all, the camshaft, crankshaft, and alternator drive gear bolts all have to be replaced. Lots of, of, uh, of uh, uh, critical um, specialized bolts. All of the cylinder uh, deck and through bolt nuts have to be replaced with new. All the pistons, all the piston pins, and all the piston rings have to be new. Rocker shafts, uh, thrust washers, crankcase through bolts. Uh, there are eight of those, and they're pretty expensive. Uh, all the hydraulic lifters um, have to be new. Um, so uh, in order for this engine to um, be overhauled, all of those parts have to be replaced with new, regardless of what their condition is. It's just a requirement of, of the overhaul. Um, at this point, Jim got a hold of me, and, and he said, he said, Mike, do, do I really have to do all of this stuff? Um, because he was very surprised at that. He said, I, I thought that all Part 91 operators like me were not required to comply with manufacturer's uh, service bulletins. And of course, this service bulletin we just went through is a Continental service bulletin. Um, but service bulletins normally are optional for Part 91 operators. And Jim couldn't understand why it was necessary to comply with this one, which was a, a very expensive service bulletin. Uh, but he says, my A&P says that he's required by regulation to replace all those parts at overhaul. Um, but how can he be required by regulation if I'm a Part 91 operator and I'm not supposed to have to comply with, with service bulletins? So Jim asked me who is right. Is, is he right that the, that the service bulletin is optional? Or is his mechanic right that compliance with that service bulletin is compulsory? And so, uh, and that's a very good question, very insightful question. And so I answered Jim and I, I said, technically, you're both right. Um, now, how can that be? Well, here, here's, here's, the, uh, here's the bottom line on that. As a Part 91 operator, which most of us are, you are not required by regulation to comply with any manufacturer service bulletin unless there's an airworthiness directive that requires you to comply with it. And there is no airworthiness directive requiring compliance with that particular continental service bulletin. In fact, not only are you not required to comply with any manufacturer service bulletin, but you also are not required to ever overhaul your engine. Um, there's nothing in the regulations that require an engine to be overhauled. Um, in fact, legally, you could run that engine for 20,000 hours, probably longer than, than, than Jim's flying career is going to be, repairing it whenever something goes wrong with it, like transplanting the cam when the cam is bad, um, and then and never have the word overhaul appear in your logbook. And that would be perfectly legal because there's no regulation that requires an owner ever to overhaul an engine. Um, and uh, as we've talked about in previous webinars, um, manufacturers TBO, um, at least for normal category aircraft, is a mere suggestion. It is a recommendation. It is not a requirement. And there's no regulation that requires you ever to overhaul your engine. However, if you ask 
your A and P to work on your engine and sign it off as an overhaul, then he is required by regulation to follow the manufacturer's guidance to the letter. And that means everything in the overhaul manual and typically all the, the relevant service bulletins. Um, because in order to call it an overhaul, the mechanic is required to follow all of the manufacturer's guidance. So, if you don't want your A&P to replace those $5,000 worth of gears, and you're happy with some of your, um, your, your rotating uh, 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 accessories, uh, your fuel pump, your alternator, because you just replaced them last year and you know they don't need to be replaced now, um, then the solution is simple. Uh, don't ask him to log the work as an overhaul. Ask him to log the work as a repair. Um, if you ask him to log it as a repair and not an overhaul, then he doesn't have to comply with that service bulletin, and he doesn't have to follow everything in the overhaul manual. Um, he can do exactly what you want him to do. He cannot do exactly what you don't want him to do, like replace a bunch of that expensive stuff that you don't think you really need, um, because he has a great deal of flexibility if you instruct him to repair the engine, but he has very little flexibility if you ask him to overhaul it. And we'll get into this in, in a little bit more detail. But th this, this is a lead into really what I'm talking about tonight, which is that it's very important to watch your language. It's very important what words you use when giving instructions to your mechanic. Um, now, when an aircraft a component of some sort, engine, propeller, an instrument, accessory, appliance, a part, becomes unairworthy, inoperative, unreliable, worn out, whatever, we usually have four options um, to, to get, get the, the airplane airworthy and back in the air. Um, we can replace the bad part with a new one. We can replace it with a rebuilt part, and I'll get into a little more detail about exactly what those words mean. We can have the part overhauled, or we can have it repaired. Um, so let's talk about the definition of those four words, because those words are, are actually defined right in the FARs, and they have a very specific regulatory meaning. Now the word new is pretty obvious. A, a new part is one that has never been used before. Um, the word rebuilt is a term uh, defined in the regulations actually in, in uh, FAR 43.2 and it means overhauled to new fits and limits, so the same dimensional tolerances as a new part, by the manufacturer. Only the manufacturer can rebuild something. Um, and if he rebuilds it, it doesn't have to be new, but it has to have the same dimensional fits and limits as a new part. The word overhauled is, is a much more liberal word, and it is defined as meaning uh, for something to be overhauled, it has to be disassembled, clean, inspected, repaired as necessary, reassembled, and tested in accordance with approved manufacturer's technical data. And approved manufacturer's technical data typically means everything in the overhaul, in the manufacturer's overhaul manual, and um, all uh, applicable manufacturer service bulletins. So to overhaul something, um, you have to follow the manufacturer's instructions to the letter. However, um, anybody can, I mean, any mechanic uh, can overhaul uh, a component like an engine, but only the factory itself can rebuild it. So again, rebuilt means overhauled to new limits by the manufacturer. Overhauled means overhauled to what are called service limits and can be done by anybody that's qual qualified to do, to do the maintenance. 
Now there are a couple of other differences um, be between um, a rebuilt engine and an overhauled engine. Um, when the factory rebuilds an engine, and as we said, only the factory is allowed to call something uh, an engine rebuilt, um, that engine, that rebuilt engine is legally an engine that's never existed before. It receives a new data plate with a new serial number that has never existed before, and it's legally a different engine. It's not a new engine but it's a rebuilt engine. It's a different engine than has ever existed before. Um, it, doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't preserve the identity of whatever uh, other engines parts were cannibalized to rebuild it. Um, and it, it, it comes with an empty logbook, what's colloquially referred to as a zero time logbook, but it's just an empty logbook that doesn't carry forward any previous time from er any other engines that previously existed and contributed their parts to the rebuilding of this particular engine. Um, so it's like a new engine in, in two respects, First, well, three respects. First of all, it's built by the factory. Second of all, it's built to the same tolerances as a new engine. Um, and, and third of all, it comes with an empty logbook. Um, it's unlike a new engine in that some of the parts in the engine may be parts that are reused. Uh, whereas a new engine, every single part in that engine is required to be a new part that has never been used before. Um, but uh, otherwise, for all intents and purposes, a rebuilt engine is the same as a new engine. It's built to the same tolerances. It's built by the same factory. Uh, and it comes with essentially the same empty logbook. Um, when an engine is overhauled, uh, which can be done by anyone, not just by the factory, but even if it's overhauled by the factory, Continental doesn't do their own overhauls, um, although they have a, a repair station affiliated that does overhauls. Lycoming does overhauls in their factory in Williamsport. They, they, you can buy overhauled engines from Lycoming and you can buy rebuilt engines from Lycoming. Of course, you can buy new ones. Um, but when an engine is overhauled by anyone, including the factory, it retains its original serial number. It's legally the same engine that it was before. It just has a whole lot of new parts in it. Uh, it retains its original logbooks and carries forward its previous operating hours but there's now an entry in that logbook that says this engine has been overhauled and it's now zero hours since major overhaul. It may be 10,000 hours since new, but it's zero hours since major overhaul. So the recording of the, the logbooks of a rebuilt engine and overhaul engine are different. The rebuilt engine comes with an empty logbook. Uh, an overhauled engine comes with a, the logbook that it originally had. It just has a new entry in it that says it's been overhauled and it's now at zero hours since major overhaul. Okay, let's see. Um, the word overhaul implies conformance to service limits, not necessarily new limits. Um, it, certainly uh, in every engine maintenance manual, um, there are two sets of limits listed. One called service limits, one called new limits. Uh, service limits are generally um, looser, uh, less demanding than new limits. And for an engine to be called overhauled, it has to conform with the service limits documented in the, in the overhaul manual. Um, for an engine to be rebuilt, it has to conform to new limits, which are essentially the same tolerances that are used in building a brand new engine. Um, now a new limits engine overhaul, and if you get your engine overhauled by a, you know, a, 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 a any almost any big name overhaul shop, they typically will overhaul the engine to new limits, not not to service limits. Um, and a new limit new limits engine overhaul is essentially the same as a rebuilt engine, except that it doesn't have to be overhauled by the factory, which rebuilt does, and it doesn't receive 
an empty or zero time logbook. It keeps its same logbook and it keeps its same serial number. But otherwise, it, it's, it's essentially the same. The word repaired, uh, the, the actual term of art is IRAN, inspected and repaired as necessary. Um, so when you repair something, you inspect it to figure out what's wrong with it, and then you repair it as necessary to restore it to proper working condition. Um, repair is a much less demanding word than overhaul. Um, it, to begin with, there's generally no requirement to measure anything when performing a repair. For example, just to give you an example, one could remove a cylinder from an engine that had a burnt exhaust valve, replace the burned exhaust valve and the, the guide, and maybe clean up the, the, the valve seat a little bit, put it all back together, install it back on the engine, and call it a repair without the necessity of ever having measured anything. Um, in fact, um, uh, Bill O'Brien, who was the, the I guess, the, the, the top maintenance guy in the FAA for decades, he, he passed away uh, a few years ago, but Bill used to go around teaching IAS uh, renewal seminars all over the country. He was a, a incredible guy, and and Bill had, a little phrase that he used to teach IAs in, in the IA renewal seminars. And he said, if you used a micrometer, then it's an overhaul. If you didn't, then it's a repair. Now that's a little bit oversimplified, of course, but, but the point he was trying to make is that when you overhaul something, every component either has to be measured and, and, and shown to at least be within service limits, or it has to be thrown away and replaced with a new one, uh, regardless of condition. And that very expensive uh, Connell service bulletin we just went through lists all the parts that have to be thrown away, regardless of condition, and replaced with new ones in order to, uh, to, to say that the engine is overhaul. That's a, a list of unconditional replacement parts that must be replaced with new, even if the old ones are in very good shape. Um, <clears throat> so a repair differs from an overhaul primarily in that there's no obligation to observe the fits and limits uh, in the, in the uh, maintenance manual, the mandatory parts replacement list that, that the manufacturers provide for overhaul, or the, the test procedures in the manufacturer's overhaul manual. Uh, in, in essence, if you ask a mechanic to overhaul something, you're tying his hands. You're saying you must do it in accordance with the manufacturer's guidance, and you must unconditionally replace all the parts that the manufacturer lists in its, in its list of, of, of mandatory parts uh, that have to be replaced. And any other parts that you don't that don't have to be replaced unconditionally have to be measured and must be replaced if they don't fall within service limits. Um, so if you ask a mechanic to overhaul something, you, you tie his hands. He's no longer able to use discretion uh, as to which parts are worn out and need to be replaced, which parts look fine and can be retained. If you ask him to repair something, then he has total discretion and can do what he thinks needs to be done and nothing more. And as I mentioned, the, the, these words, uh, overhauled and rebuilt, are dis defined right in the FARs, in FAR 43.2. Um, and, and so there's no wiggle room. When, when, if a manufacturer logs something as an overhaul and he hasn't complied uh, exactly with what the manufacturer lays out in his overhaul manual and, and his uh, um, uh, service bulletins, then he can lose his, his A&P certificate. So it's, it's pretty serious business. Um, so the, the, the choice of words you use is very, very important. And um, one of the areas that's most important <laughs> 
is uh, is 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 the expense. Um, so I'm saying not only watch your language, but watch your wallet. Um, these four different words that we can use in giving instructions to a mechanic um, are sort of a hierarchy from most expensive to least expensive. Typically, uh, replacing something with a new one is the most expensive. You know, rebuilt is, is less, overhauled is even less, and repaired is typically the least expensive option. Um, and uh, uh, often the cost of having something overhauled is much more expensive than the cost of having it repaired. Uh, give you a couple of examples. Um, if you take your propeller in to a propeller shop, uh, you can instruct them to overhaul a propeller, or you can instruct them to uh, to do an in inspect and repair as necessary. For in the case of propellers, uh, the the term used is reseal repair, a reseal repair. Um, and if you ask for a reseal repair, they take the prop apart just like they do for an overhaul and they replace all, all of the O-rings and all of the bearings and all that stuff. But what they don't do is they don't have to measure everything. They do, uh, there's an extensive amount of measuring and, and testing and stuff that has to be done in order to call it an overhaul. Whereas if if you if you ask for the prop to 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 have a reseal repair, they just open it up, they inspect it visually, and, and they 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 fix what needs to be fixed and put it back together. And generally speaking, the cost of an overhaul is on the order of twice as much as the cost of a reseal repair. If if your propellers have um, have uh, de-icing boots on them like 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 my airplane does the cost can be about three times as much because one of the first things they do if you ask them to overhaul a propeller is is rip all of the de-icing stuff off and throw it in the garbage and then they strip the blades down to bare metal strip off all the paint and they set it up on a jig and they do a whole bunch of measurements and then they put it in a big tank of, of, of fluorescent penetrant and do some more testing and then they do eddy current testing on it. It's just a tremendous amount of, of inspection and testing and, and, and measuring that they have to do in order to call it an overhaul. Uh, on the other hand, a reseal repair, they don't have to do any of that. They just take it apart, inspect it visually, replace all of the stuff that wears, put it back together, and they log it as a repair rather than an overhaul. Um, as another example, I, I've seen cases where uh, we had a malfunctioning instrument and the difference in cost between sending it to an instrument shop and asking for that instrument to be repaired and, and sending it in and asking it to, uh, uh, for it to be overhauled can be a 10 to 1 difference. Um, so again, um, you, you want to think very, very carefully before you ask for something to be overhauled, because the chances are that that's a pretty expensive option. Um, I call it the O word. The O word, overhaul, is one of the most expensive and overused words in aviation maintenance. Many owners and many mechanics are kind of spring-loaded to the overhaul position, if you will. When something isn't working, you say, well, I guess I'm going to have to overhaul it. But you don't always have to overhaul it. Um, most of the time, all you really want is, is, hey, this thing doesn't work. I want to make it work. And, and, and that's called a repair. <laughs> uh, um, and, and generally, it's a waste of money to have something overhauled if a simple repair will suffice. Uh, and often, the difference between asking for a repair and asking for an overhaul is a lot of money. Of course, rebuilt is even more expensive, and new is the most expensive word of all. So the object of the game, as a as a as a savvy owner um, who who wants to get the best maintenance he can, uh, at, at, uh, on a, in a re, on a reasonable budget, uh, the object of the game is to use the least expensive word that will make the aircraft safe and get it back in the air. Um, and, and that's really the, the message that I'm trying to get across uh, in, in this webinar, 
is that it's really important to think uh, about these words and be careful which one you choose when you're giving instructions uh, um, um, to have your aircraft maintain. And uh, Trish, that's all the prepared material I have. Um, I'd be glad to open it up for, for Q&A at this point. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Do you have any all questions? Right. <laughs> yeah, we definitely have some. Okay. So let's see here. Um, to what degree, this question is from Donald and he asks, to what degree does a major overhaul increase the value of the aircraft relative to the cost of a repair? Um, well, of course, um, the, uh, uh, the, the value, the resale value of an aircraft, I think is really what he's getting at, um, uh, is, is directly related to where the engine is in, in, in terms of its TBO. Um, it, the, 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 the aircraft's value is maximum when the engine is at zero since major overhaul and it, it decreases pretty linearly up until the engine reaches TBO. Um, if you get to TBO and the engine is still healthy and you decide to keep flying as I, I think a, a, a lot of you guys know, um, I replaced the right engine on my Cessna 310 when it got to 205% of TBO. And the left engine on my Cessna 310 is now in excess of 210% of TBO and it's, it's still trucking. Uh, but when you get to 100% of TBO, the engine is, is treated as being fully depreciated as far as, as resale value is concerned. And it doesn't continue to decline in value as you go past TBO and it's already depreciated to core value and it, it pretty much stays flat uh, from then on out uh, un until you decide to, to overhaul the engine. And then, you know, as I mentioned, there's no obligation for part 91 operators to overhaul a TBO or in fact to ever overhaul. We, you know, th in theory, you could go forever and not overhaul the engine, just, just keep repairing it. Um, so when some, when, when, when somebody like Jim, uh, runs into a problem, um, and, and his engine was, uh, I think, uh, roughly at, at mid, mid time, mid TBO when, when they discovered that his cam was bad. And so all of a sudden he has this unpleasant surprise that, uh, that he needs to, to have the engine torn down. Um, and and frequently owners in a situation like that will come to me and say, well, do you think I should go ahead and overhaul the engine or just do a repair? And the, usually the first question I ask them is, how long do you plan to keep the airplane? Because if you plan to keep the airplane for a significant amount of time, um, then you really don't care what the resale value is because you're not planning to sell it anytime soon. Um, and so there's probably very little advantage and probably none really in doing more than the repair. On the other hand, if you're thinking of selling the airplane soon and, you know, by, by soon, I, I mean, say in, in less than half a TBO from now, um, then you might want to consider the possibility of doing the overhaul because uh, because the, the the resale value of the airplane will, will be higher after you do the overhaul than before. How much higher? Well, it depends on how much engine time you had. If the, if the engine was at 200 hours since overhaul when you discovered the bad cam, um, overhauling it wouldn't increase the value very much more because it was because the value is already 80 percent of of of, uh, of, of the highest it was ever going to be. Uh, the, the more time that was on the engine at the time that you had the nasty surprise, um, the more the value of the airplane is going to increase by doing the overhaul. You don't get any increase by doing the repair because that doesn't work into the, the you know, the, the, that isn't part of the, of the fair market value equation. But where the engine is, between zero and 100% of TBO um, has a direct effect on, on how far fair market value is calculated. 
In the case of Jim, he was about half TBO when he had this surprise. Um, and so the, the, his engine was, had depreciated about 50% of the way from zero cents major overhaul to, to core value. And overhauling at that point would have increased the fair market value by that 50% um, of, of, of the engine value. Um, but I, as I recall, when I talked to Jim, he said, you know, he, he had no plans to sell the airplane anytime soon. And so I indicated to him that I thought he, he, he really, there was really nothing for him to gain um, by spending three times as much to have the engine overhaul. And I recommended that he just go ahead with the repair as it was, as originally planned as originally recommended by his mechanic. That was a long answer, wasn't it, Trish? I'm sorry. That's <laughs> <laughs> all right. You've got plenty of time. So, okay, we have a, another question from Michelle, and she asks, does overhaul reset any TAC or Hobbs numbers? No. Um, the, 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 the TAC and Hobbs will continue because it's really measuring airframe time, and you normally just make a note in the logbook that says, you know, zero cents major overhaul equals X, Y, Z on the tack or um, in, in, in my airplane, I, I made a little label with a label maker and I put it on the panel right above the Hobbs meter to, that says what the adjustment is to go from Hobbs time to, to, uh, to engine time and so on. But no, it, 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 you, you don't actually reset the meter. Uh, you, you just make a note of, of what the time is. Perfect. Always, always in the logs, and and if you're like me, you also put put a little a little placard on the panel. Okay. The next question is from Imran. Uh, could you clarify the definition of owner produced parts and when they are acceptable for use? Oh my God, uh, that's that's a little off subject, and it's a very long uh, answer. Um, Actually, let, let me shorten the answer by saying that um, I did a webinar uh, a few years ago that is on the EAA video server in the archive uh, that talked specifically about owner-produced parts, and it was about an hour's worth of discussion on this on this subject. So I would refer the, the questioner if you if you go to eaa.org slant webinar and uh, and look in the archive uh, uh, if you search for owner produced parts you'll 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 find my webinar on the subject and it goes into all of that in great detail okay uh let's see I, I didn't mean to you know to not answer the question but there's no short answer to that it's a long complicated answer so Trish, did I lose you? I'm sorry. I oh, sorry. accidentally muted and was talking <laughs> oh. and no one was hearing me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the next question is from Walt. And he asks, does a factory rebuilt engine have the same mandatory parts replaced as an overhauled one? Does a factory rebuilt engine have the same mandatory parts replaced as an overhauled one? Um, it has at least all of those parts replaced. In, in fact, generally speaking, uh, the factory engines have more um, new parts in them than the service bulletin requires. But I think that's also probably true of overhauled engines done by, uh, by uh, a, you know, a, a, any, any of the big name shops. They, they typically go the extra mile in terms of, of parts replacement. But the, the answer is yes, the, 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 the factory the factory plays by its by its own rules and and does replace all of those parts and more uh, that are listed in the service bulletin when they when they rebuild the engine. Okay. Uh, next question is from Ralph, and he asks, "How can a discontinued engine, like a Franklin engine used in a Stinson aircraft, be overhauled if parts are not available?" Well. Um, I, uh, first of all, I have to add a caveat that I'm not an expert on Franklin engines. I believe that there are a couple of companies that specialize in providing 
replacement parts for Franklin engines, even though they're no longer in production. But the technical answer to his question is um, that if you if if the if the overhaul manual for the uh, or or or, uh, or or other manufacturers instructions specifies that certain parts have to be replaced and those parts aren't available to be replaced then technically you can't call it an overhaul you'd have to call it a repair you know the other the other side of the coin is there's no legal requirement to ever overhaul the engine and there's nothing wrong with just calling it a repair I mean, I suppose it just complicates the resale value a little bit because you have to, you'd have to explain, you know, I, I, I repaired the engine to, to, uh, to new fits and limits, um, but I couldn't call it an overhaul because, you know, the, the through bolts weren't available anymore or something. Um, you know, that's a, kind of a, a typical sort of problem that you have with, with, uh, airplanes that are no longer uh, supported by the manufacturer but but technically you, you, if the, the definition of the of the word overhaul is that manufacturer's guidance has to be followed if the manufacturer's guidance can't be followed um, then you can't call it an overhaul okay uh, the next question is from Francis. I have a Lycoming engine repair that has only the crankcase and crankshaft original parts and all other parts re were replaced with OEM replacements, but the accessories were given IRAN surface. The question is, how should the logbook entry be made? Well, it, um, I would have I'd have to look at the corresponding Lycoming service bulletin to see exactly what the requirement is. But if if Lycoming's requirement is is comparable to Continental's, which I'm guessing it is, that all rotating accessories um, attached to the engine must be overhauled uh, at engine overhaul, then um, if some of the rotating accessories were not overhauled, you, you, you could not legally log that as, as a major overhaul of the engine. You'd, you'd have to log it as a repair and explain that all the provisions of the overhaul manual were followed except that the magnetos were, 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 uh, were IRAN and not overhaul or something like that. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Walt. He asks, does a prop strike trigger only a teardown and repair or a more extensive check of dimensional limits? Um, I, both Continental and Lycoming have quite extensive service bulletins that describe, first of all, define what a prop strike is. And they, and they both of them define it quite closely to one another, but they're not exactly the same. And they also define what um, action has to be taken uh, after a prop strike, um, uh, during a post prop strike uh, teardown. Um, however, if you have a prop strike, you are not required by regulation to follow the service bulletin if you have a Continental engine. If you have a Lycoming engine, you are required to follow the service bulletin because there's an AD that mandates that that service bulletin be complied with. So it's a little bit lopsided. Uh, for Continentals, it's strongly recommended that you follow the Continental post-prop strike inspection procedure. And if the airplane is covered by insurance, insurance always pays for all of that stuff. So it's sort of silly not to do it. Um, if you have a Lycoming, you really don't have any choice because there's an airworthiness directive that mandates that after a prop strike, as defined by Lycoming, uh, the Lycoming service bulletin be followed. 
Okay. Uh, next question is from Robert, and he asks, what's the difference between a factory reconditioned and a factory rebuilt engine? There is no such thing as a factory reconditioned engine, and there's no manufacturer I know of that ever uses that word. Okay. The, the, the words, the, the other word that just always drives me nuts is people very frequently refer to something as a remanufactured or reman engine. Uh, that word is meaningless. It does not appear in the regulations. It's a marketing word, and, and, and there's no formal definition for what reman or remanufactured means. Most people, when they talk about a, a, a remanufactured or reman engine, are talking about a rebuilt engine. But the correct words to use and the words that are defined in the, in the FARs are new, rebuilt, overhauled, and repaired. And uh, we should try very hard only to use those words and not to use other words like like reconditioned or, or, or remanufactured because words like that really don't have any well-defined meaning. Okay, that was helpful. Uh, next question is from Thomas. Uh, he says, may I work with the AMP or IA and perform my own inspection or measurements on various internal parts to determine whether they should be replaced? Um, the answer, well, it's a kind of a mixed answer. You, you may work with the A&P, but you may not perform the measurements or the inspection. Um, the, the FARs allow um, non-certificated mechanics to do almost anything that a mechanic can do under the supervision of a mechanic. But one of, one of just about the only thing that an uncertificated individual is not permitted to do under supervision of a mechanic is an inspection. An inspection has to be done by the person signing it off. He's not allowed to have any help. He's not even allowed to have another mechanic help him do that. He has to do it himself uh, legally because his name is, is, is on, the, uh, on the logbook entry where he's making the airworthiness determination. But you can help him do every, do anything else. I mean, you could pretty much do the whole overhaul yourself under supervision, and it would be perfectly legal as long as he signed off your work. Uh, but the inspection part, he has to do himself. Okay. Next question is from Barbara, and she asks, what is the difference between a major repair and a minor repair? Ah. <clears throat> um, the the answer to that question um, lies in two places in the regulations. Um, there's a um, there's a definition of of major repair in FAR 1.1, which is the part of of the FARs where all the definitions are, and then there is um, a section of Part 43, the maintenance uh, a part of the FARs, uh, called um, um, Part 43 Appendix A, that contains um, a laundry list of different of, of specific kinds of repairs that the FAA considers to be major repairs. Um, definition of minor repair is very simple: it's any repair that doesn't qualify as a major repair. Uh, but major repairs are, um, the definition of major repair is kind of complicated. And, and again, to figure out whether a repair is major or not, you need to look at the definition in, in, in FAR 1.1 and the list of repairs that the FAA considers to be major in Part 43, Appendix A. Um, operationally, the difference between a major and a minor repair is that a minor repair simply needs uh, an A&P to sign off a logbook entry. A major repair requires um, what's called approved data that, that explains exactly how to do the repair and is signed off by, 
by either an FAA employee or an FAA designee. So it's, it's, it's approved data. And um, a major repair also needs to be documented on a Form 337. And that Form 337 has to be sent into the FAA in Oklahoma City, and it becomes a permanent part of the, uh, of the airplane's uh, records in, in Oak City. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, repairing a damaged wing rib is a minor repair. Repairing a damaged wing spar is a major repair. How do I know? Look in Part 43, Appendix A, and you'll see uh, in the airframe section of the list of major repairs that that spar uh, wing spar repairs are considered to be major repairs. And there's a, a list of other things like that that are considered to be major repairs. Okay. Next question is from David. He asks, I have a certified Lycoming in my RV6. I'm an A&P, non-IA. I signed off the condition inspection. If this engine were ever to be considered certified, for example, for the purpose of a sale of the engine, is that all that would be required, a subsequent inspection by an IA? Um, well, there, there's, there would be no requirement to, to have an IA inspect that engine in order for you to sell it. Um, the buyer of the engine, if he put it on a certificated aircraft, would eventually need to have his aircraft go through an annual inspection. And uh, at that time, he, of course, would need an IA to inspect the entire aircraft, including the engine. Um, but for, for you to sell, sell that engine to somebody else who's putting it not in an RV, but in a you know, a Cessna 172 or whatever, um, you don't need an IA to inspect the engine to do that. Um, it, it, the, the burden is on the buyer of the engine, and he really wouldn't need to have an IA look at the engine until annual inspection time uh, of, for his aircraft. Okay. Next question is from Lindsay. She asks, what is done in a top overhaul? Would a prop strike teardown qualify? No, uh, top overhaul, which is a really terrible term. I wish, we, I, I wish we didn't have to say that because a top overhaul is not an overhaul. <laughs> it doesn't meet the legal definition of overhaul, but we've been using that terminology long before I, I, I got into aviation back in the early 60s, so uh, we're not going to change it. A top overhaul simply means that all of the cylinders on an engine are replaced. A top overhaul implies um, that only top end work, that is work on things that are bolted onto the engine from the outside, are, are, is done and implies that you did not split the case of the engine. A top overhaul is typically done with the engine hanging on the airplane. Uh, doesn't it, it, If you pull the engine out of the airplane and split the case, you don't call it a top overhaul anymore. So um, a post-prop strike teardown inspection always requires that the engine be removed from the aircraft, the case split, and the crankshaft go, go through a bunch of, of uh, non-destructive testing to determine whether it was damaged in the prop strike and uh, also requires all rotating engine accessories to be torn apart uh, and inspected for, uh, for prop strike damage. Uh, none of that is, uh, would be considered part of a top overhaul. Top overhaul is simply replacing all the cylinders at once um, and is something that's normally done with the engine still on the airplane. Okay, next question is from Chris. Um, he says, hydraulic lifters are made as a pair. What would happen if they are put together after deflating and mixed the pair up? Um, well, I assume that he's, you're probably talking about Lycoming lifters and you're talking about the, um, the tappet part of the of, of the lifter and the and the internal lifter body, um, th they don't have to be paired up. What they have to do is pass uh, 
a uh, um, a test where you inflate the lifter with oil, you put it under pressure, and you see how how long it takes to bleed down. If the lifter passes the bleed down test, then then it's okay. Um, uh, so uh, you know those the neither the lifters nor the lifter bodies are are serialized. They don't have serial numbers on them, and um, there's apps, there, there's no actual requirement for those things to be treated as a pair. Although it's it's a it's a good idea not to let them get separated, but um, the 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 test is really wh whether it'll pass the bleed down test, which is a test of how close the tolerances are. It's a, it's a functional test of the of, of the lifter assembly. Okay. Next question from Mark. When judging used aircraft, is there a sweet spot in hours since overhaul, or is it better to just go with the lowest time? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I have I have an opinion on that, but it's not it's a, not a universally held opinion. So I'll I'll tell you what my opinion on it is, and uh, maybe that'll stir up a couple more questions. I don't know. Um, in my opinion, uh, the best way to buy a used airplane is with a run-out engine, with an engine that's at or beyond TBO. Um, the worst way to buy an airplane, in my opinion, is is one that has a relatively low time engine. And the reason I say that is this. If you buy an airplane with an engine that's at or near TBO, or what I'd call a run-out engine, um, the, the price that, that you're paying for the airplane has been discounted to reflect the fact that the engine is essentially at core value. So you get that airplane, one of two things are, are going to happen. E either, either the engine starts getting sick and you go ahead and overhaul it, which is what you were planning to do anyway, and it was built into the price. Or you get lucky, like I did, and you get to fly that engine for another three or five years before it before it needs overhaul, in which case you you get a windfall. If you buy a, an airplane with a low time engine, you are spending a lot of money on that engine in anticipation that that engine will most likely reach TBO at least. Um, but you have no way of knowing, really, um, how that engine was treated uh, and, and what the likelihood that that engine is, is going to reach TBO. So there's a potential for nasty surprises. You, you will have paid money in anticipation that that engine will not require an overhaul until quite a long time from now. And then if, if Somewhere along the line, you get a bad surprise like like Jim did, where somebody pulls a cylinder and discovers that the cam's going bad. Um, then then you have whatever. What's the opposite of a windfall? You you, you have a nasty surprise that uh, that endangers your wallet. So my own personal opinion is that the the best way, certainly the safest way, to buy a used airplane is to buy one with a with a run out engine with an engine that that's high time that's close to TBO or at TBO or even beyond TBO because then you're not spending any money uh, in anticipation that the engine will give you further service if it does um, y you win if it doesn't you you've a, you, that that's what you're expecting you know you know you're buying it with a run out engine and you've budgeted the 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 overhaul as part of the purchase, so that, that's that's my opinion on the subject. But like I say, that's not um, universally held opinion. And I think you know most. If you if you ask most aircraft brokers, that they, they would prefer to be selling an engine with a low time uh, an, an airplane with low time engine than one with a high time engine, because most prospective buyers. Um, don't think about it the way I do. They, they're not sophisticated enough. They think that the lower the time engine they get, the the, the better off they are. Um, in my view, the lower time engine you get, the the more risk that you're you're taking away from from the seller. And so I, I just look at it in a different way. Okay. 
Next question from Terry. If a person is going to purchase an airplane for other than Part 91 operations, he shouldn't purchase an airplane with an engine past TBO, correct? No, I can't even imagine why, why you, anybody would say that. Um, if a person is purchasing an airplane, say for a Part 135 operation, there's no reason that, that that airplane he purchases can't be at or be on TBO, um, that person would have to look in his operation specifications to see what he agreed to to the FAA when he negotiated his Part 135 fine certificate. Um, if the op specs say that, um, that the operator has to uh, comply with TBOs, and, and not every Part 135 operator has such a thing, then you would buy that airplane with a run-out engine or a 150% of TBO or whatever it is, and you would overhaul it immediately. Or um, if the engine was at TBO and it still seemed to be in really good shape and the compressions were good and the oil analysis history was good and the oil filter didn't have any metal in it, you would go to your principal maintenance inspector at the FISDO and apply for a TBO extension. And TBO extensions are routinely granted to Part 135 operators, um, frequently 20% ext extensions, uh, and it's not unheard of to, to, to get 50% extensions. The difference is and with Part 135 is you have to ask, whereas in a Part 91 operator, you don't have to ask the FAA, you just Go ahead and do it. Um, you don't need permission. Um, but again, there's no reason in the world that a Part 135 operator uh, shouldn't buy an airplane with a run-out engine. Or uh, it's it's simply that when after they buy the airplane, they would either have to overhaul the engine right away, or they would have to go to their FISTO and ask for TBO extension. Okay, next question from Jack, and he says, wild question, but is the term rebuilt the same in Australia? I have an engine that was redone by the factory down under, and it came back with a new serial number. Oh, that's a good question. You know, the, the, I, I, used to be, I used to be pretty up to date on Australian maintenance regs, but it's been quite a few years since I looked at them, and I know that there have been a number of changes. Um, if I had to make an educated guess, I would say that the term rebuilt in, in Australia, it means the same as it does under the FARs. Um, but I, I can't absolutely guarantee that that's a correct answer without doing some research. Okay. <laughs> uh, next question is from Walt, and he asked, can an airplane be restored and have its airframe zero timed like a factory rebuilt engine? Oh, that's a great question. Um, in principle, it could, but I don't know of any aircraft manufacturer that offers such a service. Of, of, of rebuilding airframes. So um, I, I think the answer is theoretically yes and practically probably not. Okay. Um, next question is from Michael. And he says, Mike is talking about TBO, but members need to remember the infant mortality rate might outweigh engine overhaul. Could Mike talk about that? Well, again, I, I have several uh, webinars uh, on the EAA video server in the archive um, on, that, on, on this very question, um, in which I present a lot of very interesting data about the infant mortality risk uh, of piston aircraft engines, which is really astonishingly high, and make the argument that um, overhauling an engine at TBO if the engine shows all outward manifestations of being healthy um, is much more likely to cause 
a catastrophic engine failure accident than to prevent one. Um, again, I, I can just make the statement here, but but if you'd like all the data that 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 backs that up, um, if you uh, if you go take a look on on the uh, EA video server, you'll find um, a couple of different webinars that address that uh, directly and show some of the research that that has been done. Uh, on the the causes and timing of general aviation engine failure accidents. And it turns out that the overwhelming majority of engine failure caused GA accidents occur with very young engines, not with very old engines. That's interesting. Uh, next question is from Scott, and he says, please explain again the requirements of complying with service bulletins. Okay, well, it's it's, it's very simple. If, if you're a Part 91 operator, which most of us are, um, there is no requirement to comply with any manufacturer service bullet, regardless of what adjective the manufacturer uses. They can call it mandatory, they can call it critical, they can call it anything they want. Uh, but as a Part 91 operator, uh, there is no requirement to ever comply with a manufacturer service bulletin unless there is an airworthiness directive from the FAA that mandates such compliance. And the perfect example is, we just talked about a few minutes ago, that both Continental and Lycoming have service bulletins saying what to do after a prop strike. The Lycoming service bulletin is mandatory because there's an FAA AD that makes it mandatory. The Continental service bulletin is, is a, a mere suggestion. It's a good suggestion, but it's, it's only a suggestion because there is no AD mandating compliance with the Continental service bulletin. So again, the, the answer is we never, as Part 91 operators, we never are required to comply with any manufacturer service bulletins, regardless of whether the manufacturer says it's mandatory or not, um, unless there's an AD comp uh, compelling us to, to, to do so. Um, let me also add that the situation is somewhat different for Part 135 operators whose op specs may or may not require them to comply with all manufacturer service bulletins, mandatory service bulletins. Different op specs are, are, are written differently. It's a negotiated document between the certificate holder and the FAA. And so each one is, is written a little differently. But if you have, uh, if you're a 135 operator, you have to do what your op specs say you have to do. And let me also point out that um, None of what we've just, uh, what I've just talked about uh, with regard to service bulletin compliance applies to um, SLSAs. Uh, there are no ADs against SL SLSAs. Uh, the manufacturer of the L LSA um, issues its, essentially its own ADs, they're called safety directives. And, uh, and, and whatever the manufacturer says you gotta do. Uh, with, with SLSA. It's a very different situation. Um, normal category aircraft, uh, most of what the manufacturer says is a mere suggestion and it's not required unless the FAA says it's required. For SLSAs, uh, almost everything that the manufacturer says um, has the force of law. It's, it's, a, it's a very different rule. Okay. Uh, next question is from Gary, and he asks, is there a difference between a grass or hard service prop strike as in engine repair requirements? Um, well, what you need to do is read the applicable manufacturer service bulletin, either from Lycoming or Continental. Both of them um, start out with a definition of what they mean by prop strike, um, and they are worded quite similarly, not identically, but quite similarly. The, the, the general rule is that any event that results in the propeller being damaged and being damaged enough that it has to be removed from the airplane sent off to a prop shop 
constitutes a prop strike. The engine doesn't even have to be running. Um, if, if, if the airplane is sitting in a tie down and a VW bug backs into the prop and bends a blade, that counts as a prop strike, even though the engine wasn't running and triggers um, the requirement to tear down the engine and, and do all of the NDT on the crankshaft. Again, it, it's literally a requirement if it's a Lycoming. It's a very strong suggestion if it's a Continental because there is no AD mandating compliance, but you'd be kind of dumb not to do it and your insurance will normally pay for it. Um, so it, the definition is a little bit more complicated than that because uh, the Continental, for example, also says that any event that re, that, that involves the prop hitting anything enough to cause a reduction in RPM constitutes a prop strike. But the practically what really matters uh, for both Lycomings and Continentals is whether the prop was damaged enough to require a repair, to uh, a repair beyond just a little nick that a mechanic can file out with it with the prop still on the airplane. If the prop has to go to a prop shop, then it's considered to have had a the engine is considered to have a, a, a propeller strike and, and, and you're supposed to tear it down. In the case of Lycoming, you're required to tear it down. Okay. Um, we have, let's make this the last question. It's from Michelle and she asks, how do these terms apply to avionics? Um, need to think about that for a minute. Um, I believe that uh, most of the terms would still apply to avionics. Obviously, new, we, we know what a new piece of avionics is. Um, uh, many, many avionics manufacturers do offer uh, rebuilt units. Um, obviously, we know what repairs are. The only question I have is overhaul. Um, I don't, in, in general, avionics manufacturers, I, at least in my experience, don't publish an overhaul manual. And um, so I don't think in general that the term overhauled is used very commonly with avionics. Because again, the only way you can overhaul something is if, is if there's an overhaul manual that tells you what to do. Well, no, I take it back. Um, I, w I was thinking more about the electronics kinds of avionics, but we frequently overhaul instruments and instrument manufacturers do publish overhaul manuals like for gyro instruments and so on. Um, and, and so for, for those sorts of things, instruments that, that are, you know, primarily mechanical as opposed to prim primarily electronic, uh, we definitely do, do uh, uh, have overhauls uh, on, on those. And the, the rules are the same. The, the only thing that I talked about that really doesn't apply to anything but engines is that business about a, a rebuilt engine coming with a zero time logbook. Um, other things besides engines don't come with zero time logbooks. In fact, they don't come with any logbooks at all. You, you know, don't, we don't typically have a GPS log <laughs> logbook. Um, so the business about about zero time logbooks is is an engine only issue, and it's addressed in a regulation that speaks only to engines. All of the other stuff I talked about with respect to new rebuilt, overhauled, and repaired uh, would apply to avionics. Um, and again, uh, it's common to overhaul mechanical avionics like gyro instruments and stuff. It's not common, in my experience, to overhaul electronic. Um, um, avionics. And again, I'll add a caveat. I'm not an avionics tech, and so it's conceivable that 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 I might have misspoken a little bit. But I think I think that that answer is substantially correct. Okay, super.
Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. If you didn't get your question answered and it's a burning one, um, Mike has his information up here for you on the slide so you can contact him. And we just want to say thank you to Mike for doing this webinar for us tonight. I think we had some great uh, questions and I think it was a great topic. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Trish. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, let me just mention um, a couple of my, my upcoming webinars. As you know, I, I typically do one of these webinars the first Wednesday of every month. Um, <clears throat> Uh, next month, uh, the topic is is going to is, is the lost art of repair. Well, well, and and that sort of relates a little bit to what we talked about tonight, where we'll talk about um, the 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 difference, you know, when you when you can repair something versus when you need to replace it. Uh, on in the June webinar is entitled "Suck, Squeeze, Bang, and Blow," which are the four cycles of a four-stroke engine. We'll be talking about. Uh, 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 piston engine combustion theory and, and so on. Um, I am not going to do a webinar in July. I guess I'm going to need to tell Tim that because uh, I'm, I'm going to be uh, at the Flying Physicians Association convention uh, the first uh, the, the first Wednesday in July. Um, so the next webinar after that will probably be the first Wednesday in August right after uh, right after our venture. And um, just uh, as usual, uh, I would invite anybody who hasn't already done so to sign up for my free monthly e-newsletter um, uh, where we uh, talk every month about uh, about uh, maintenance related topics. The uh, You can do that one of two ways. You can uh, do it uh, by checking a box in the in the survey uh, that that uh, Trish is about to, to, to put up after we uh, close this webinar or you can go to the website SavvyAviator.com and you can put your name on the list uh, uh, to receive the, uh, the, the monthly uh, e-newsletter that way. And finally, if you haven't already taken a look at it, I would encourage you to, 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 to go to Amazon, take a look at the, my book called Manifesto, uh, where I talk uh, you know, about, about maintenance philosophy and stuff. And, it's gotten very good reviews, and I think you will you will enjoy it. And and with that, Trish, I we're, I think we're done. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night.